Welcome to Gray's Reflection, the Common Man's Bible Study. Today we're still in Paul's second uh, missionary journey. He has landed at Corinth, and he has landed at Corinth according to the letter he wrote, Corinth. He came to Corinth in fear, weakness, and in trembling. And that was from all the pain he experience on his travels, being beaten, being stoned, left for dead, uh, being in prison, put in stocks, uh, so on. And these uh, played a real, real heavy on his head and on his heart. And so that when he came to Athens, he delivered a message and he got out of town. And now he comes to Corinth, and he comes to Corinth obviously very afraid, very afraid of more beating, because it seems that everywhere he goes, the gospel is given, and the gospel creates a division, and the division is violent. And uh, so Paul is now in, in Corinth, and he, God encourages him. He encourages him by sending Aquila and Priscilla, who are born-again Christians, who are Jews, and who just happened to be in the same trade, uh, tent makers or leather workers. And therefore they can talk to Paul, encourage Paul, uh, share uh, intimate stories with Paul, and so on. And not only that, but his friends who he had left uh, up in Thessalonica have come back, Timothy and Silas have come with him, so now he's encouraged, now he has fellow workers, so he's encouraged, encouraged even more. And the greatest of all encouragement the Lord himself appeared to him in a vision and told him basically that no man would lay hands on him in Corinth. In other words, you are safe here. You are under my protection. Nobody's going to hurt you. So that would give him a little bit of courage. And according to the scriptures, it says here, he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And this is where we find Paul, where we pick it up here. Now, just because no man will lay a hand on him does not mean he will not get opposition. Keep that in mind. So, he comes here in verse 12. We're going to begin in verse 12 of chapter 18. And when Gallo uh, was the deputy of Achaia, and the Jews made an attack with one accord against Paul. In other words, here we, the, what has happened in all the other towns is now being repeated here. Remember, Paul goes to the synagogue, speaks to the Jews, and the Jews get all upset, etc. And here they are, they're going to make an attack against Paul. And they brought him to the judgment seat. And here's the reason they brought him to the judgment seat, just like they did in the other towns, for the same reason, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, we studied this before, so we understand what he's talking about here. This is the Roman law. When Rome conquered a people, etc., or in all conquered lands of Rome, uh, worship of gods were forbidden unless the, they were approved by the Senate or, or the Roman Senate. Because any worship of God or any mention of God, etc., was in direct conflict with the worship of Caesar, which Rome wanted to, uh, uh, to increase and to uh, perpetrate and, and, and pass on through all, all, all their conquered people. So therefore, they're saying that this Christianity is contrary to that law. So they bring him to the Romans, to the Roman magistrate, and, and they, well, they want the Romans to pronounce him guilty and punish him. So they bring him before the, for the law, and this is, what, this is why they bring him there. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, in other words, Paul was about to defend himself, uh, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or a wicked crime, O you Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. In other words, he looks at them and he, he understands the situation. He doesn't need to hear a defense from Paul or he doesn't need a defense from the Jews. He understands the situation. And he says this, If this were a matter of law, if Paul was breaking the law, I would side with you. And obviously implying that I would pronounce him guilty and would punish him appropriately. 
He says, but if it be a question of words and names, and of your law, look you to it, for I will be no judge of such matter. In other words, he says, as far as, in other words, what it boils down to is this, as far as Gallio was concerned, all this amounted to was simply a matter of semantics. What he was saying was this, basically, he understood it this way. You Jews have been teaching that the Messiah would come. You've been teaching about a, a Messiah. And here comes a Jew, and he's telling you who that Messiah is. That's, that's all Gal Gallio saw. He didn't see... Uh, Paul preaching something against Rome, Roman law. He simply saw that the Jews, the Jewish religion was approved by the Senate in Rome, and it was permitted to exist so you could worship Jehovah. And all he's saying, and Jehovah, in the worship of Jehovah, etc., you had the coming of Christ, the expected Messiah. And all that was going on was Paul came and told you who the Messiah was. So therefore, Paul was in the same, uh, I would say, the, the, the same area or the same understanding that the Jews were. But the Jews were upset because they didn't want Jesus as their Messiah. That's, that was an internal problem. And he says, if that's the case, then you take care of it according to your laws. Now, in religious matters, Rome had given the Jews the right to carry out and pass judgment and punishment Oh, according to religious or within their religious uh, confines. And uh, we see that in Jerusalem when we study Jerusalem, and we see that when, when Paul himself, Saul of Tarsus, uh, wrecked havoc with the church. Uh, we see it when Stephen was stoned. Uh, the, the Romans backed right off and didn't do anything because as far as they were concerned, this was an internal Jewish matter. It was a religious matter, and they didn't want to get involved with it. And so, so here we have the Jews, rather than attacking Paul on their own, they're going to take it to the Romans and try to have the Romans pass the law, and Gallio's not buying it. He's saying, this is a, this is a Jewish thing. And when we look at Christianity, etc., we see that it finds its source in Judaism. It springs from Judaism. It, it, it has the same Messiah, it has, a, it has the same scriptures, the Old Testament. It, so, that, so we can pretty well understand where Gallio was, and he was a pretty clever man. So when you look at the protection of Paul uh, throughout his stay in Corinthians, you also includes Gallio. So not only did Jesus appear to, to Paul, but he also had Gallio in the wings waiting so that there would be legal protection as well, which gave Paul a freedom to preach uh, freely for a year and a half, which, which is what he did. It says this, and he drove them from the judgment seat. In other words, Gallio said, get out of here. And he, and he drove them from the seat. It says, then all uh, the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of these things. In other words, what happened, what happened was very simply, uh, uh, they could not get Paul, because Gallio had ruled against them. So they took the leader of the synagogue, and, and you'll notice who did it. The Greeks did it. The Jews did not do it. The Greeks did it, and the Greeks beat uh, Sosthenes, and uh, Gallio looked at it as a, basically, a, my hands off. That's nothing to do with me. This is a religious matter, and therefore you take care of it yourself. And they took care of it, and poor Sosthenes, our brother in Christ, took a beating that day. Then it says this, And after Paul tarried there yet a great while, and then took his leave of the brethren, he sailed from there to Syria. Now here's his travel again. It says this, And with him was um, Priscilla and Aquila, Paul having shorn his head, in uh, Caesarea, it's not Caesarea, it's Chesnia, I should say Chesnia, for he had a vow. And that's all the Bible says. I want to spend some time on this this morning. A vow. Paul made a vow. And he made it 
Let's go back here a moment. Let's go back here. Here's Paul in Corinth, and he went to this little city, uh, Chesarea, which is right here. And he, and he made a vow, and they, he's going to travel all the way over here and on, on his way, and he made a vow. Now, what, the, what was this vow? We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But the scripture does give us enough hint to indicate what it might have been. Part of the vow was the shearing of the head, or the shaving of the head, and it wasn't shaving his head bald like a lot of people think. It was cutting your hair, giving yourself a haircut. And it was giving yourself a haircut, not as a normal haircut like you would give yourself a normal haircut. It was a, if it was a vow, it was cutting your hair, keeping the hair that you cut, and bringing it to the temple and burning it there at the temple and as an offering to the Lord. Now, you have to ask yourself, okay, what vow in all of Scripture would that pertain to? And the... Closest one we can come up with is he took a vow of the Nazarite, a Nazarite vow. Now, Paul is a born again Christian. Now he's he's taken an Old Testament vow. Now let's understand what makes this vow right or what makes this vow wrong. It is what we have to understand. Number one, was Paul taking this vow to enhance his entrance into heaven? The answer is no. Was he taking it to add to his salvation, to somehow extract grace from God? The answer is no. Was he take, taking this vow to keep uh, uh, some kind of legal law or rule? The answer is no. Now we have to check. What was, why was he taking this vow? Well, we have to look at the circumstances that produced this vow. Um, a Nazarite vow, we'll talk about what it consists of in a minute, but a Nazarite vow was taken by many men, usually as an expression of thanks for a deliverance of some kind. The Lord might have delivered them from their enemies in a battle, and therefore they would take a Nazarite vow to thank the Lord for what he did. Uh, or it might have been a deliverance of a crop. Uh, uh, protection from a plague, uh, any kind of thing like that, where a man was very grateful to the Lord and he wanted to express his gratefulness, his thankfulness to the Lord in a special way, he would take a Nazarite vow. So therefore, it had nothing to do with salvation, it had nothing to do with legalism, it was just a personal thing between the individual and God. And the other thing we have to consider is this, we're still in a transitional period, so we're going to run across a lot of uh, activity of, of Old Testament, New Testament. We're still in that in that shaky period. A Nazarite vow is usually a vow that is taken for 30 days or 60 days or 100 days. Very, 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 very few men were lifelong Nazarites. I think the Bible only mentions three. But a 30-day vow, a 60-day vow, a 100-day vow. We don't know which one Paul took. If this is what he took. What we're doing here is it's all hypothesis. But we look at if a Nazarite vow, most Nazarite vow were taken to express thanks to the Lord for some sort of deliverance, what was Paul delivered from? When he came to Corinth, he was extremely fearful of getting another beating. And therefore God literally rescued him from that beating or from those beatings. And he is extremely, extremely thankful. And when the law is applied, the Lord, it appears the Lord rescues him from that also. And gives him freedom to speak without the threat of somebody hurting him. And so consequently, he is extremely thankful. And he goes back to his roots and he makes a Nazarite vow. Now a Nazarite vow has three parts. One, it, a man would not touch anything from the grape vine or the grape. He would not touch the vine, he would not touch the field, he would not touch the grapes, he would not touch the wine that was produced, the grapes produced. He would not even touch the leaves which were used in salads. Wouldn't touch it at all. The second thing he would not do is he would not touch dead things, anything that was dead. He would refrain from that. And the third thing he would do, he would cut his hair. 
He would not cut his hair, rather, for the, whatever the length of time he had chosen for the, for the vow to be. And we don't know if, the, if this was a Nazarite vow, and it appears that it was. Uh, we don't know what Paul did. But we do know that the Nazarite, that the vow was over when he came to this city, and he cut his hair. Now, according to the vow, he had to travel to Jerusalem, go back to the temple, and burn his hair. And we're going to find him traveling back to Jerusalem, and, go, and being found in the temple because he had a vow, and he burns his hair, and he offers it to the Lord. Now, this is Paul's way of expressing his great thankfulness to the Lord. It, it is mentioned here that he had a vow. That's all he mentions. It mentions he cut his hair. But it doesn't tell us why. It doesn't. Every, every, all of these things are a guess on our part based on the, the surrounding scripture and, and the surrounding circumstances. We can understand that this is what it must be. This is not something that is legislated by the Lord. This is not something that is commanded by the Lord. This is, not, this is just something that springs from Paul's heart. Now, in today's world, uh, men make vows. And, and some of the vows are negotiation sort of thing. Lord, if you will do this, I promise to do something <laughs> this as a result. Uh, you see a lot of that foxhole promises, foxhole conversions we call them. Uh, this is not one, this is not what this is. Th this was not commanded by the Lord. This was not, <clears throat> and, and therefore Paul did this freely. I think uh, most of the things we do today, uh, if we make vows unto the Lord, etc., if our yeas are yeas, our word is our bond, and if we say something to the Lord, etc., we ought to carry it out because that's what is expected in the scriptures. But this is not the same thing. He made a vow unto the Lord. Now, today we use things like prayer and fasting. And most of the time it's to, it's to show a great emotional desire to receive something, and uh, such as uh, we fast, etc., or prayer when someone is sick, etc., and we want a deliverance the Lord to deliver them from that sickness, or we want whatever it is, and it generally is a uh, something that is, is personal, and it doesn't last 30 to 60 days or 100 days. It usually lasts three days to a week, and, and it's, it's done voluntarily. It's not commanded. It's done voluntarily so that the desired thing that we want the Lord to do, it shows how earnest we are about it. Uh, if a man today decided to take a vow of some kind and decided that he was going to fast as a way to thank the Lord for what the Lord has already done, uh, that is between he and his God. That's, that's a personal thing. That's not part of the church. That's not part of the scriptures. That's just... That's just a personal relationship. It's whatever that relationship demands. I think this is what Paul is doing here. And therefore, we will find him in Jerusalem. We will find him in the temple because he made that vow to the Lord. And the vow was to express his thankfulness. So when I look at this and I examine this and I say, is this the vow Paul took? I can't say definitely that it is. But if it is, doesn't it give light to the statements in Corinthians chapter 1 when it says, When I came to you, I came to you in fear, weakness, and trembling. And now we, under, we begin to understand the degree to which that fear was. So that when the deliverance came, it brought so much thankfulness from Paul's heart that now this is what he did as a personal thank you to the Lord. And the Lord did not write this here. Did not write that, uh, say that Paul took a, a Nazareth vow. It just says he took a vow. And I think he did that so that the church would not accept this as something that they had to do. And I think that's why it's, the details are not written here. But it does give us an, an idea of the, 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 the mind of Paul when it came to 
of what he had experienced in these other towns. They weren't just beatings. They were beatings that affected the way he thought, affected the way he acted, affected his emotions of fear and trembling. And yet he had the Lord on his side. And this showed him that the Lord was there because the Lord appeared to him. So uh, we, we need to understand this. Then it says this, And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogues and reasoned with, with the Jews. Now you'll notice he left here and he crossed the Aegean Sea and he came to Ephesus, which is here. Now Ephesus plays a very important part because Timothy is going to have a real ministry in Ephesus. And uh, some of the great doctrines come from the book, of Ephesus, the book of Ephesus, or the letter of Ephesus to the Ephesus church. Now it says this, and he says, and he reasoned, this is where he's showing his hair, and now it says this, and he reasoned with the Jews, in other words, he went into the synagogues and he began speaking to the Jews. When they desired him to tarry a longer time with them, he consented not. In other words, they wanted him to stay, and they wanted to hear more of what he had to say, and he says, no, I'm, I'm going to leave. But he bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that comes to Jerusalem. Now, he's not a Jew. There's a feast that is coming to Jerusalem. He's, he's not a Jew. And yet, he's going to keep this feast. And why would he keep this feast? Well, he was going to keep this feast because of the vow he had made. And he's going to end up in, in, the, in the temple. And he says this, and, and the feast... But I will return again unto you, if God will. And we have to understand that he understood exactly who was running the show here, and exactly who determined where he would go and where he wouldn't go. And he says this, And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed in Caesarea, and had gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. Now, let's take a look at where he went. Okay, now he's in Ephesus now. When he leaves them, he sails. He sails all the way down to Caesarea, which is right here. Uh, you can see. Then it says this, okay, he went to Caesarea, he landed in Caesarea, and he'd gone up and greeted the church. Now, we think of up at north and south, but remember in those days, going up was elevation-wise. So he's in Caesarea, which is a coastal city. Now he goes to Jerusalem, which is up. Don't matter where you go, from around Jerusalem, etc., if you are going to Jerusalem, you're going up. So he goes up. And there we see that he is seen in the, in the temple. And there we believe that he is bringing his hair that he had caught to be burned and offered to the Lord. Now, is there any grace coming from this? No. This is simply his expression. It is a, simply an act between, a private act between him and his Lord. Uh... And that's why the details aren't here. Now, why would he have to cut his hair? He would have to cut his hair because it was normal to have get a haircut. Um, simple. It was simple as that. And that's right. Would take a uh, the, when he takes this vow, he would promise not to cut his hair, so that anybody who saw a man, a Jew with long hair, would realize that this Jew was under a vow and therefore would not tempt him with wine, or, uh, you know, if he offered him uh, a meal, etc., he would not sit down with him and drink wine, or anything from, from the vineyards, or he would not show him his vineyards and walk around, and as, as uh, hospitality often demanded. Uh, in other words, he would understand this man was under a vow, and therefore would respect it. And the hair would give him the trigger. The man would not have to tell him, Oh, I'm under a vow. I can't eat this meat or I can't go to here. I'm under a vow. And so therefore, the hair would grow. How much would it grow in 30 days? Would it grow noticeably in 30 days in a month? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see how. But 60 days, it'd be noticeable. 100 days certainly would be noticeable over three months. It would be noticeable and men would see it. And, and at the end of that time, you'd simply have a hair, get a haircut. So therefore, we, we see this. We see this happening here. It says this, and uh, it says this, and he went, he, and he went, and then it says this. So he greeted the church in Jerusalem, 
And we and all the scriptures have this event going on. And then it says he went down to Antioch. Now you will see as he went down to Antioch, he went from here, from Jerusalem, he went down. This is that going down. It's going from elevation, it's going from a mountainous area here. It's going down to the plains along the along the along the sea. And he goes to Antioch. Now, where is Antioch? Antioch was where this trip began. The Antioch is is where they were first called Christians, and Antioch is the church that sent Paul and Silas out, and therefore he goes to here. And now, from here, what does he do? Well, it says this, and after he had spent some time there, we don't know how much time, but he spent some time there, and obviously much of what he did was not only preaching, but much of what he did was recounting and telling uh, what he had experienced, and, af and that's just simply being responsible. When churches today send out missionaries, these missionaries must come back occasionally and give report. Now with the convenience of, of uh, the internet and, and, and cyberspace, it's very easy for the, uh, the missionary to give a weekly report, sometimes a monthly report, to the churches that support them. And therefore they can just, fact, you know, email it out, and the church has it, and this is what I'm doing, and this is what happened, and give account of all this. Paul didn't have that convenience. He, now he's at Antioch, and he's telling them what happened, and he's telling them of the established churches in these towns. And uh, now you need to pray, and you need to send out missionaries with them. Then, he, and then it says this, And after he had spent some time, he departed, and he went all over all the country of Galatia, and Phrygia in order to strengthen all the disciples. Now, what did he do? He left here, he left Antioch, and he went into this area here. He went into this area here, Phrygia. And uh, uh, there he, the churches that he had established in Lystra, and Iconia, and Antioch here, Presidia, uh, all these churches in here, this is where he traveled, and what he did there was encourage uh, the believers, and uh, give them God's word and, um, you know, allow the church and help the church to get established and to build. And this is what he did. And I think this is what you need to do to any, any church that you start. Uh, oftentimes, uh, churches today start other churches. And uh, once that church is sufficient and able to to be on its own, then they break off and they allow them to operate themselves. But until that point is reached, they are constantly sending uh, speakers, they are constantly sending fellow workers over to help them, to assist them, to help them set up programs, to help them run different things, etc., help them outreach and so on. And once that church is established, then they hands off and they let them run their own business sort of thing. And uh, many churches are like that today. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, church planting is basically that sort of thing. And, and Paul is like a mission is a missionary, and he's you know constantly going back and forth, back and forth, uh, strengthening those churches. So we're going to call it quits for today. We're going to uh, wish you Godspeed. Come on Victory Side, and I pray that you have a great 4th of July holiday. See you next week.